Welcome to The Point. I'm Marcia Kramer. Today we're getting right to the point with controversial criminal justice reform coming to New York, some rules taking effect as early as next month. And for months, we've reported on New York City's forgotten families in the controversial soda program. Now, a scathing report sheds light on why homeless families were placed in decrepit homes. Plus, a new fleet of cargo bikes taking over for delivery trucks. Are they a solution to street congestion or just taking up more space? Our panel will break down all those talking points later, later on. But first, let's get to the point of view from Queensboro President Melinda Katz. Victory still smells fresh for the incoming uh, Queens District Attorney. She defeated Joseph Murray after a nail-biting primary against Tiffany Caban. The borough's new top prosecutor takes office next month in place of the late Richard Brown, who served as DA for nearly three decades. Katz will have to hit the ground running, enforcing brand new criminal justice reforms set up by the state, as even more proposals go before the legislature in January. Melinda, thank you so much for joining us today, and I want to get your opinion on some of those new criminal justice initiatives that are being talked about. First of all, the legislature is going to have to grapple with marijuana, legalizing it or not, your feelings. So they decriminalized it. First of all, thank you for having me, Marcia. <laughs> it is always a pleasure to share the set with you uh, throughout the years. Um, so they've decriminalized marijuana, which means that it's basically now a summons. And, and there's a lot of reasons for doing that. Um, I believe it was a, an excuse for stop and frisk. They'd see someone smoking marijuana, they'd be able to stop them, talk to them, get the name, get the ID, all of that that comes with it. And so that's already been done. And so now they're going through a process of, of expunging the convictions that have happened in the past for low-level marijuana. And so we are, the office is already working on that and will continue to work on that on January 1st. Would you like to see it totally legalized? I don't think we're there yet. I think right now we need to stop arresting people of color at much more percentages um, than anyone else. And I think that was really a big part of it, right? Which is was was that it wasn't it wasn't a law that was being enforced equitably throughout our communities. And I think the knowledge of that and you know the the understanding of that was behind the law. So how would you feel about providing compensation to the wrongfully convicted? I think we have to look at that, but I think at this point we want to make sure the priority is to make sure that nobody's serving time uh, that was wrongfully convicted or convicted of marijuana, which now is not decriminalized. So another thing that's being proposed or people want them to look at is to re restore the voting rights for people who are either in prison or on parole. How do you feel about that? You know, I haven't opined on that yet, but I think it's worth looking at and seeing how we um, how we do that. You know, voting is a privilege, um, and that is how the laws were created, that it is a privilege, that we want people to be able to vote. Having said that, many people don't partake in the, that privilege. You know, my election alone, only 10 percent of the people came out to vote who had a right to vote in that Democratic primary. And I think that's even more um, of a problem than anything else. People should come out and vote. People are dying all over the world for that that extreme right to be able to come out and cast their vote for the elected officials they care deeply about. So along the lines of, of rehabilitating people, um, how do you feel about ending lifetime jury duty, the lifetime jury duty ban for people who are convicted of felonies? I think, I think we should look at that. I do think right now we are stealing convictions of people that have nonviolent convictions over 10 years old, whether it's a misdemeanor or a, a felony. And if it's nonviolent, they get a chance to go back and say, hey, it's been 10 years. My record is clean. I've done nothing wrong. And we did that a lot as the borough president. We worked with a lot of the groups throughout the borough, a lot of the cure violence groups, mental health groups, drug rehab, and to make sure that if you had convictions over 10 years old, that you're able to get a second chance. You, know, you, go, to a, you go to a job interview, you're perfect for that job. You want to put food on your table for your children and for your family. And by the way, you're going to put food on your table however you have to do it. Um, and so to be able to seal those convictions are important. It is the sign that a second chance really does work. Should inmates over 55 who've served at least 15 years of their sentence be eligible for parole? So that's a, a David Weprin bill that we look at that again. I actually believe in that. I think that we should look at them. I'm not sure the age is the right age. You know, I think it needs to be uh, discussed more in the legislature. But I do think that there is value in looking at people that have been serving a long time. I also don't think at the parole board it should be an automatic um, uh, dismissal by the district attorney's office that we don't believe in parole for anyone. I don't think that's right either. I think it should be looked at as a case-by-case -case basis. So as a district attorney, would you go to bat for somebody who's 55 and has had 
or some age that you determine is appropriate that's had 15 years of their sentence and say they might be eligible for parole? I think I have to get in there. I think I have to look at the cases case by case, but I certainly wouldn't uh, discount that. Uh, but most importantly is the parole that's happening now. Um, many of the, um, what happens is the district attorney will send a letter saying we're against parole. Um, and I do think that needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think just automatically being against it is a fair way to look at the criminal justice system. Another thing that um, district attorneys are going to have to look at is a proposal by the would-be presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg, who says that one way to end mass, mass incarceration would be by reducing the length of sentences people get for individual crimes. Your feelings about that? Yeah, and I think we need to look at that, because I'm not sure that he's totally wrong. I think especially when it comes to um, you got to look, have total um, knowledge of the uh, backgrounds of the individuals that are getting longer sentences, whether it's equitable across every culture, whether it's equitable within the crime and the charge that they are being convicted of. And right now, we don't really spend, I think, as much time looking at that as we should. And on a nationwide basis, I do think it would be nice to have some sort of stability and some sort of, um, you know, neutral uh, standards across the country. In that regard, do you think that judges sometimes over-sentence or under-sentence? And do you also think that the laws have to be changed so that the penalties for individual crimes might be shortened? You know, my issue with uh, penalties is that they need to be equitable across. And I think that's part of the problem. People look at those that are being sentenced um, and, and arrested uh, and higher bail, and it clearly impacts people of color more than any, anyone else. And I think that's really the biggest problem, is the equi equitability across um, the sentencing for the country, but really in New York City as well. I mean, so there should be more sentencing guidelines? There should be more sentencing guidelines, but I think we need to look at what those guidelines are. And, you know, the guidelines are great as long as you uh, take a look, make learned decisions on what those are, and then institute them fairly across the, the justice system. What about outlawing the use of deceptive interviewing techniques to induce confessions? You know, that also goes into the videotape. Can you, should you have uh, videotaped confessions for all the confessions? Number one, I do believe you should have videotaped confessions. But I also believe you need to have corroboration. And I think part of what the Conviction Integrity Unit is going to do, because we are going to have one um, very early in my administration, um, is, going to be looked, is going to look at all of those confessions um, and that the corroborations might not have been as strong as they should be. Repealing the law against loitering for the purpose of prostitution. I know that's something you talked about in the campaign. We need to get the sex traffickers. And we need to get those that are forcing people into the business of sex work. And we need a way to do that. And one of the ways to do that is to build trust and build compassion and also give people a way out that wants a way out. Um, but in Queens, sex trafficking is a huge issue, and by percentage, we have more of it in our county than most other places. We do have a human intervention trafficking court um, that is now uh, being run by a great judge, uh, and so we'll be working together to really try and get those traffickers that are just, you know, you, you, you get a job for a nanny's position or a housekeeper position or any retail position, and then all of a sudden people are coming here, and that's not what it was. There's been an epidemic of people killed by motorists, people killed by motorists driving badly. The Manhattan District Attorney, Cy Vance, has said there should be something called a Vehicular Violence Accountability Act, that people should face criminal charges called death by vehicle or serious injury by vehicle. I wonder if you subscribe to that or you think it's going a little bit too far. I think that a district attorney has a lot of discretion to charge the crime that they believe was committed, whether that's negligent homicide, whether that's vehicular homicide, uh, or whether it's injury because of those charges. So I would utilize them to the fullest extent of the law. Um, you know, as you know, my mother was killed by someone driving illegally. I do think driving drunk is one of the most selfish crimes that one can commit. You get into a car, you know that you're inebriated, you know that you're probably not at 100%, and yet you don't care. Like, you, you just drive um, knowing that it is possible that you might injure someone because of your um, not being at 100%. It, it's a crime that needs to be addressed, and we need to take it seriously. Should there be criminal penalties for those yeah, things? I believe there should be criminal penalties for those things, yes. Should the legislature but we pass also an need act? To, 
We also need to look at who's doing it and case by case also, because while there should be criminal penalties, we also want to treat the person as well. Is it, you know, are they um, an alcoholic? Do they need services? And we need to do both at the same time, because we don't want them just right back in the courtroom a month later doing the exact same thing. So I do think we need, just like I believe we need for violence and for kids that are, uh, you know, joining the gangs and, and having, committing violence in their high schools, we do want to make sure that we um, get service for the individuals while making sure that they just don't end up back in the courtroom the next month. So the acting uh, Queens District Attorney released the names of 65 so-called bad cops whose testimony could undermine a prosecution. I wonder if you think that was the right thing to do. I can tell you that the PBA president, Pat Lynch, is furious about it, saying it's giving in to the pro-criminal advocates. I wonder what, how you, what you would say to Pat Lynch, but also how you feel um, it was handled in the, by the office. When those items are done um, in pursuance of their duty, then yes, I believe they should be released. But there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I also think it should be self-policed as well. Um, when a police officer gets a confession, when a police officer makes an arrest, that police officer is going to walk into a courtroom um, if it goes to trial and truly have to testify. And the veracity and everything in the past of that police officer is going to be talked about. It's going to come out in evidence, and it's going to come out in the trial. And so I think that when you're doing all of these um, roles as a police officer, you need to make sure that, that that testimony is going to stand at trial. Otherwise, you put all this work into gathering evidence, getting all the testimony, all of the stuff we need to get a conviction, and then all of a sudden we find out that the veracity has been questioned in the past. So I think it, it helps everyone to know that once it gets to trial, that's not going to be an issue. So do you think the policing, and I put that in quotes, of the police officer's testimony is the, is the job of the district attorney or the assistant district attorney, or should the police department itself be making sure that the officers they send to you in, in different cases have the goods before they come to you? I think it should be both, and I think both have a little bit of a different role, right? So the police officers, uh, the police need to make sure that they're getting the evidence that they need, that they're getting me what I need to actually do a case in court. But from their perspective, the behavior of that police officer may or may not be part of what they're giving me. But from my perspective, when I put a district attorney out in a courtroom to get a conviction or to actually have a trial, and I have a police officer who has all of these CCRB violations or veracity issues, that's going to affect the way that we do our trial. The elephant in the room for you and every other district attorney are the looming reforms from criminal justice um, actions that were taken by the legislature that go into effect January 1st, a few days before you take the oath of office. There are new rules about cash bail. There are new rules about disclosing the identity of witnesses. How are you going to deal with it? So just so everyone knows, um, many of the district attorneys are already starting to do no bail for counts that the charges that they know are not going to have bail after January 1st. So the offices are already sliding into that. Um, and many of the district attorney's offices have a good percentage of, pe of people being out. I believe bail is one of the most inequitable things that we have in the criminal justice system. You can do a crime that's worthy of about $500 or $1,000 in bail and be sitting on Rikers Island for months before you're even in front of a judge, before you're tried for that, because simply because your family can't afford to get you out. On the other side, you can do a crime worthy of a million dollars in bail, pay $100,000 in a bond, be home for dinner that night with your children and be walking your kids to school the next day. Bail is only supposed to show that you are going to show up in court. And at the end of the day, the way it's used is just not equal across the board. The bail reform is going to mean that if you have a nonviolent felony, a class E nonviolent felony or any misdemeanor, yes, you can go out that day. Uh, there is no bail. Um, and there's also no supervised release uh, in most cases. So we are going to have to figure out how to get people into that to some extent to get help. Are there any circumstances under which you would ask for cash bail? I think in the beginning we need to figure out with the court how not to have bail anymore. It's an inequitable system. I promised and I believe in no cash bail. And so we are going to get there at some point in my administration. That brings up the, the, the prospect of what you do about sexual assault and domestic violence victims, people who committed crimes. I mean, they could as you talked about, be home for dinner right. and be home to the same place where they committed the sexual assault or beat their wife or their cousin or some other 
person in their home, should they be allowed to go free? So those are some of the circumstances in which we have more authority on what happens to the defendant once they're in the courtroom. Uh, it also is a very large part of the discovery issue, right? So if you have discovery on a random crime, either it's gang violence or rape, or sexual assault, and the, the defendant doesn't have all the information, you need to figure out how to adhere to the 15-day discovery rules while not giving away the information, the victim's phone number, the victim's address, uh, how they, where they work, how they can be found. And so right now, we are going through the whole process in the office of figuring out how to do that, starting on January 1st, by the way. And not only that, figuring out the backlog of all the other cases that we haven't dealt with yet on the 15-day discovery. The new police commissioner says that some of those things in the law ought to be amended. Do you think that that's true? And will you be making any recommendations once you have time to evaluate it? Right. I will not be making any recommendations until we have time to evaluate. But I do believe that I think people should know that are watching this. The no bail law doesn't really um, go towards violent crimes. It doesn't go towards rapes. It doesn't go towards kidnappings. It doesn't go towards uh, murder, you know, or, or even attempted murder. It is for low-level nonviolent crimes. And I think that that's important for people to realize. And before we say the sky is falling, I think we need to see um, how it works out in the system. And by the way, we also need to see whether those low-level um, low level misdemeanor crimes, whether the people that are getting arrested are accessing services, which allows them not to be there a month later, right? And so it puts them in the system while trying to access that. But I think we need to see how it works before we claim the sky is falling. But one of those things that people are concerned about is the fact that police officers are only allowed to give a desk appearance ticket in a case of forcible touching or groping. I wonder if that gives you pause. Well, anytime there's forcible touching or groping, it's got to be taken seriously. And it, of course, it gives me pause. But at the end of the day, I think it's really important to, for people to remember that these are cases that are not in front of a judge. They are not um, prosecuted. Um, the defense has not been able to wage a defense. The defendant has not been able to. And I think that as we're talking about criminal justice reform, we do need to remember cases have never been tried. They've not been found guilty. Our criminal justice system is based on innocent until proven guilty. And for the more violent crimes and the crimes that we're most worried about, we still have remand as an option. And so I don't want people to forget about that. This is not we're letting everybody out. This is that if someone should be remanded, they would be remanded under the present day laws or under the future laws. And so that still exists. Melinda Katz, the new Queens District Attorney, taking the office by storm. Taking we can't wait storm. till you take office. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Marsha. We will be getting to this week's hot topics in our panel coming up after the break. Mm -hmm.